Hello, Calvary Bible Church. We are thankful that you're able to join us. We are still disappointed that we're not all together, um, but we are honoring our government as they have continued to give us additional instructions about um, our stay at home uh, order. And so you'll see we've already begun to adjust to paring down our band to, to meet the requirements for uh, less than 10, but we're still here to worship with you. And we hope that you're watching this because you're ready to worship too. Well, all the stuff that's going on in this world uh, doesn't change the fact that God is still worthy to be praised and that wherever you are, you can worship. And so you may not feel up to singing alone in your living room or having family worship time, but, but I would encourage you to, to step out of your comfort zone a little bit as you worship God. And worship doesn't just mean music and song, but it's one of the expressions that we collectively do as a church every week. And, and I, I pray that you are encouraged uh, by worshiping the Lord. I think in times like this, that's actually what we need more uh, than anything is, is to worship because it calibrates our hearts and our minds to a God who is in control, a God who keeps his promises, a God who has not left us or forsaken us. And I know that you're probably dealing with cabin fever, restless, not being with people that you care about, or maybe you're dealing with real anxiety about this whole thing. Um, wh wherever you're at, God is ready to, to interact with you and ready to, to speak to you this morning through his word and hopefully through your expressions and worship as we worship God together. And so we're here to worship. We're not going to stop worshiping God as a church. We're still going to encourage you to, to be in his word, to worship him wherever you are under any circumstance. So join us this, uh, this morning for you uh, as we worship God together. Step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. The King of all days, oh so
and bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Seen like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. So we don't have many announcements for you this week, uh, but we do want to let you know that we're still preparing for uh, Holy Week services, and they may morph and shape in, into looking a little bit different than uh, what we had expected. But we do want to let you know that we're planning to do uh, a Good Friday online service where 
we're going to have communion. And so we would ask that you prepare for that. So you have a couple weeks to, to make sure that your family or your household or you individually are ready to uh, participate in communion. And so you can have some elements there, whether it's just bread or crackers or, or some grape juice. And, and you can uh, reflect with us as we remember the work of Jesus on the cross. Uh, it's a special time. And you can always keep up to date with information as, as we communicate it um, on our website, on our church app, which you can look up uh, on any of the app stores and just type in Calvary Bible Church dash NH. You'll be able to find all of our, our information about how we're uh, amending our, our services or, or trying to get information and content to you amidst all the stuff going on with COVID-19. And as always, we would encourage you to take the time to email us as pastors or email our, our office. And, and if you have needs, if you have prayer requests, or if you need to talk, if you're dealing with just kind of the weight of this uh, isolation and, and you, need, you need to just interact with somebody, I know that I'm missing conversation. That's, that's something that I'm already beginning to notice the lack of that in my life. So please reach out and communicate to us. As we move forward in our service, we're going to sing this next song, Nothing Without You. And it calibrates our, our hearts and minds to know that anything that good that happens in our life is not apart from Christ. It is only because of the work that he has done that we are able to, A, know what love is, and B, know how to love in return. And so... There's all this stuff going on, and, and it's easy to, to feel alone, but this is a great reminder for us to say, look, we're, we're not alone. And even when we think that we have something to offer, we're nothing apart from Christ. I have nothing to boast in other than the work of Jesus. So, so let's sing this together. Let's be encouraged together by the nature and the person of Jesus.
we listen to this message that we're going to hear from Pastor Tally, I can't help but think of the progression of, of my life and how God works to, to sanctify us, to build us, to, to mold us. And so uh, he is worthy to have our lives built around him. And so uh, let's sing that together. Let's think that as we, as we wait on the Lord, as we continue this process of sanctification and studying that, unpacking that together, let's build our lives around God together this morning. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you.
again and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken let's pray together lord we will not be shaken when we are rooted in you for if you are with us who can stand against us lord may be we be rooted in your love may we be building our lives around your worth you are indeed worthy to be praised and lord as we give as we continue to to bring our offerings our sacrifices to you lord may we be doing so with a cheerful heart a glad heart because you indeed are worthy lord as we continue to to submit ourselves to your word and to the teaching of your word may we be renewed may we be strengthened may we be encouraged may we be challenged and lord we we want to see you do great and mighty things in the lives of our community so we ask that you would work in a mighty way while everybody's home isolating that you would draw souls unto yourself in this period of waiting. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you can join us and be with us as you are watching online, wherever you may be this morning. Well, we just wanted to talk a little bit this morning as, as we begin our service here and uh, have some announcements. Just wanted to talk a little bit about the shelter at home emergency order that's been put out. And so we're trying to, trying to figure that out still. So we are changing on the fly. So we're gonna have a little bit different format maybe this morning than what you've seen in the past. But we continue to get educated and find out really what it means. We're trying to seek counsel, but what it means concerning shelter at home. And we understand that um, ministry workers uh, or church workers are, are exempt and considered essential. So we are glad that we're able to bring this to you this morning. Again, you may see some modifications in the days to come. So, But we also want to let you know that we're still available to minister to you uh, if you have any needs. So please reach out to us. Um, we'd be glad to do that. And that's our role in our community, in our community here at Calvary Bible Church, and our greater community here in this area. So, so please, uh, don't be bashful about that. Please let us know how we can help you. All right, so this morning, I want to let you know about Good Friday is coming up. Right, so Good Friday is coming up, but we also want to let you know that it's going to be at 6 p.m., but we are planning to have the service online or have an online presence. We're not sure what that's going to look like yet, so we ask you to be patient. As, we, as things continue to change, we're modifying to that, as I mentioned earlier. So, but we do want to let you know that, that you could uh, log on and, and you can get online with us, and, and definitely we will be having that Good Friday service, as Pastor Chris had mentioned earlier. I also want to let you know that Easter, the same scenario for that. So Easter, we're anticipating we're going to be online as, for that as well. So we pr plan to have that celebration uh, and, uh, and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the good news and the hope uh, to all the world. So please consider joining us uh, for that as well. So again, a little bit different format, but we are glad to, uh, to be able to worship with you. Uh, despite the fact that uh, it's electronically and we're from a distance, uh, but we are his church. Whether we gather together or not, we're still his church. And again, we're glad that you could be here. So would you join me this morning as we have some prayer? We're going to pray for our, our service. We're also, we want to thank those of you that have been faithful uh, in providing your offerings and, and some have mailed in your offerings and things like that uh, or had, had given o online. Uh, through our church app uh, or our website. So we're thankful for that, for your faithfulness. We ask you to continue being faithful uh, to the ministry here at Calvary, our church, and, and supporting the ministry that we have here. So I'll pray again for the service and I'll also pray for, uh, for our offering as well. So let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come here and to worship you and, and to join together uh, d despite the fact that there's an absence of physical presence here, but, but we are together, Father. We are your church. And Father, we ask you this morning to use Pastor Talley in a mighty way uh, to preach your truth 
And Father, that we can apply that uh, to our life and that your Holy Spirit will speak to us and, and guide us in that. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be not only sanctified as your church, but also maturing as your church, God. And uh, so we ask you to speak uh, very clearly. Uh, Father, we know that difficulty uh, matures us, and many of us are going through some challenging times. So we pray concerning that as well. And Father, we ask you for your guidance. So this morning, we ask you to speak to us indelibly, as only you can. Also, Father, we ask you to bless the offerings that will be uh, received And Father, thank you for the faithfulness of your people who are giving. And uh, we ask you, Father, to bless them. And and, and Lord, guide us in in ministering to this community, our our church here at Calvary, and our people, and also those in the community and the surrounding communities. How can we best minister to them? So Father, we ask for your blessing, your blessing upon this service. And we ask it in, in the sweet name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning to everybody. This is, as we've been mentioning over the weeks, this is a little strange. It might be strange to see me without a tie on, but uh, it's actually Friday morning, not Sunday morning for us. Uh, We had to scramble with the uh, governor's declaration that came out uh, late Thursday afternoon. And so we recorded the worship and we've recorded the sermon today. And so it's a little different for us, and we continue, as Pastor Ron and Pastor Chris have mentioned, we, we continue to uh, figure out how to best minister in this day and age. And the stay-at-home order, you know, we've, we've asked the question, who really are the necessary workers? We got a little bit more clarification uh, this morning or late last night, church workers, but how is that defined, and what does that really mean? And And so you have to go and look at the list, but the list doesn't give you the answers you want. And so there's a lot of questions about how our online service will be going on moving forward. And so we we understand it and believe it's to be necessary for the spiritual well-being of our congregation through this crisis. So we're going to do everything that we can to make all that happen. And uh, may just, as has been mentioned, may be just a little bit different. And so all these questions are swirling around. I've, I've asked and have been in communication with all my pastor friends, and, and they're having the same questions that we're having. What do we do? How do we manage this? And how do we continue to do the necessary work of Christ during this time where we're being asked to stay at home? And, and the questions are there. The answers are still somewhat vague. But 1 Thessalonians 3, the passage that we have this morning, is, is, is just so relevant for us. It always amazes me when I have the opportunity to work ahead, as those who know me know that I do a preaching calendar, and I have a preaching calendar that usually stays six months to a year in advance. So last April, May time frame into June, I was working on the preaching calendar in 2020, and I knew that I was going to be away and... and, um, January and a little bit in February on on missions trips. So I knew that I had to um, look at maybe towards uh, March for starting a series, and we were working on 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And so we were preparing for it, and we were planning, and we put together our pre-study, spent some time working through each of the books, making sure we had a preliminary outlines and, and all that, and had it all completed by July. And uh, we then tucked it away and pulled it back out again from time to time to review and to continue to get our minds focused on this time. But I can tell you right now, all the stuff that I did in the study, the pre-study and preparing and all of that, none, none of this that we're going through now came to my mind. And even when studying this passage and separating out verses 11, 12, and 13 from the rest of chapter 3, even though it's just a small passage of Scripture, I never knew that it would be so important for me, even as I come to this particular time as a pastor here at Calvary Bible Church. And because we are like Paul, we've expressed that already, we feel torn apart in a way. Paul was torn apart by the persecution. He had been ministering in Thessalonica. He was ripped away from that because of the persecution, because the gospel went forth. 
people were getting saved and those around them did not like it and they, they began to persecute. And so Paul had to be scurried out at night and gotten away from all of that lest he cause more trouble. The Thessalonican church is still experiencing persecution and Paul is concerned about them. And yet he feels this disconnect like we do and because we're not able to gather together. And we have a whole lot more ways of communicating and contacting one another than Paul did in his day for sure. But Paul did everything that he could to make sure that they were in, they were in good uh, state of mind. He wanted to make sure that they were growing spiritually. And so we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11, 12, and 13. And we get a glimpse of, of Paul's hope about the sanctification and maturation of a church that he's not able to be next to, that he's not able to have face-to-face -face conversations with. And so the, the important stuff that's in this passage is so relevant for us today. So let's just pray and ask God's blessing as we study His Word together. Our Father, we do thank You for the timelessness of Your Word. We also thank You for the way in which You orchestrate even planning that took place over a year ago, you, 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 plan, you planned it all out and you had it all figured out and you knew that at this time we would be at this passage and we would be able to receive your encouragement as we look to your word. So we thank you for that. We marvel at your ability to do that. But we thank you for it. And we ask your blessing in your word here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now last week we, we saw that Paul was a man of prayer and prayer was an essential part of his ministry and his strategy for ministry. And this week, once more, we're going to get a glimpse into his prayer life because chapter 3 verses 11 through 13 are essentially his pastoral prayer for the Thessalonians. And it is important to note that the content of his prayers is not focused on the daily issues. Now we know daily issues can consume us. We're experiencing that now. What's the next, out, uh, you know, latest breaking news? What's, what's going to happen next? We're, we're hanging on every word, and so, so to speak. But Paul's not focused on those things. The Thessalonians, they were worried about persecution. They were worried about what was going to happen next as well. But Paul's prayer time for them doesn't focus on that. It doesn't say, Lord, spare them from the persecution. But he focuses rather on the larger spiritual issues. Lord, grow them spiritually. Now this doesn't mean that those daily issues are not important. It simply means that Paul understood that the priority was their sanctification and their maturation. So Paul prays to the one who brings this priority to fruition. He breaks in prayer. And this, these three verses are his prayer for God to do a work. Why is that the case? Because here's what we need to understand. Sanctification and maturity in Christ are accomplished by the sovereign work of God, coupled with the obedience of the believer, living in light of the Lord's return. But it's the emphasis on God that we see. God's role in this passage is prominent in his prayer. Even a cursory reading of this prayer, the emphasis of the Godhead jumps off the page. The person of Christ or God the Father is referred to no less seven times in this short prayer. But equally important in Paul's mind is the kind of love that was essential for the sanctification process. So he talks about that and he prays about that. And of course, never far from Paul's mind was the fact that our Savior would soon return. And this was a motivating factor for him in everything that he did. So I suggest to you this morning that the pathway to maturity is laid out in the key points of his pastoral prayer, and we would do well to incorporate them into our prayers and in our lives as well. So listen as I read this prayer and listen for the role of God that is talked about here and the importance of love and the coming accountability of the return of Christ as Paul prays. Here's what he says. Now, may our God, he's entreating here, may our God and Father, 
himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you that and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless and ho in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And so in this short prayer, Paul highlights first and foremost the role of God. And as I suggested, seven times the Godhead is mentioned. And they're put on the same level. They're, they're, they're seen as equal, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And grammatically, Paul emphasizes this. And so we have the two parts of the Trinity being emphasized here. And so there's a lot of theology that we could unpack here this morning. But we're not going to at this time. But I do want to pull out the emphasis that Paul has on the role of God in the sanctification and the maturation of God's people. He first of all talks about God's role in bringing opportunities to minister to one another. Notice verse 11. Now may our Lord and our Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Paul seeking God's face, looking for the opportunities to once again have a face-to-face uh, time with these Thessalonians so that he can impart his spiritual wisdom. He can have a spiritual influence in their lives. And he knows that he has to go to the Lord God for that to happen because God is the sovereign God who orchestrates these things. And so Paul seeks his face. Paul's mentioned earlier in chapter 3 that Satan has hindered him in being able to go. And so now Paul is seeking the Lord. Give us this opportunity. And so I think it's an important thing for us to understand as we think about ministry, even during these difficult days. Lord, provide those opportunities for ministry to one another. May we have sensitive eyes to see that. May we, we seek God to give us that opportunity to minister to one another. And Paul seeks God for it. And it's a great example because God is the one who can orchestrate things. God's not caught by surprise by any of the things that are going on. He's not caught by surprise by the difficulties that we're facing as a church and as a, as a uh, community, as a state, as a nation. He's not surprised by any of those things. But his work will not stop because of stay-at-home orders or anything like that. We just need to seek God for these opportunities to minister to one another. And then the first part of verse 12, he says, he shows that us that God's role is, goes even beyond just bringing opportunities for us to minister together and to one another. He goes into verse 12 here, the first part, that God is also about bringing about the growth that we, we desire. Here he st states the fact that God... The sovereign God is the one who produces the sanctification and the maturation that Paul's focused on here. Look at what he says in verse 12. We'll again read verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound. Now I just want to stop right there because he's going to get to the subject of love here in just a moment. But I don't want to miss the emphasis that Paul places here. And he, he says, may the Lord make you increase and abound. And so Paul here is acknowledging the role of the sovereign God in our sanctification and maturation. And that's exciting because even as Paul has been torn apart from the Thessalonians, and even though we may feel somewhat distant from one another because we're not able to gather like we would normally do, our sanctification and maturation doesn't need to be put on hold. So many things in our culture and in our day are being put on hold. Things are on pause. Why? Because we don't know what the next thing's going to happen. We don't know what the stock market's going to do. We don't know what the next directive that's going to come down. What's the next order that's going to come from our government? What, are we, what is going to change every day? Something changes. And so many of us are simply putting a pause 
on things that we might do normally, but we don't want to do now because we just don't know, or we're not sure what the path forward is. And so that is a, is a, a difficult circumstance for us to deal with, this whole pause, the uncertainty of it all. But it's not necessarily a bad thing because we can pause and recognize that God is at work. And so Paul here is acknowledging, yes, I can't be there. Satan's hindered and and I'm praying that God will give us that face to face. But God's at work. And may the Lord do the work of growing you and sanctifying you and maturing you. I think Paul never, ever forgot that Paul was just simply a person that was a tool or an instrument in God's hands to be used for others. But it was God that was doing the work. When Paul writes the Corinthians church, he talks about, hey, don't get all excited about this person or that person. Don't say I'm of Apollos or I'm of a Paul. No, we're all just simply servants who are ministers of God, but it is God that gives the increase. And so the encouragement that we have here this morning is is that God is at work in you and in me. And even though we may be separated or isolated to a certain degree, God is at work and He continues to work in us. And so we need to use this slowdown or this pause that's taking place as a time to hear from Him because He's the one who grows us and matures us and sanctifies us. It's His work. Here's an important principle that I think we need to understand. Ministry is not about God lining up with what we are doing but it is us getting in alignment with what God is doing. We have to align ourselves with what God is doing. And we need to recognize that every situation that we step into, every opportunity that we come into that's a ministry opportunity, God's already there. God's already at work. It's not resting on our shoulders to to accomplish His purposes. God is accomplishing His purposes. And He's using us. And yes, we need to be obedient. And we need to be following and, and being faithful to Him. But it's God that's doing the work. And Paul, in his pastorly prayer, you can hear his heart for his people. But he knows he can't be with them. But he's not dismayed. He's not discouraged. Because God is at work. And so ministry is not really about us lining or getting God to line up with what we're trying to do. It is about what God is doing and us getting alignment with Him. And so Paul, first and foremost in his prayer, he lays out the important ingredient or the important principle, key to our sanctification and maturation as believers. It's the role of God. But as we said in the beginning, it's not only the sovereign God at work in our lives to sanctify us and mature us, but it's also coupled with the obedience of the believer. And verse, the latter part of verse 12 talks about the believer and their responsibility in all of this, the importance of our love that we have been given here. Here's what he says. He says, verse 12, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another, first of all, and for all, secondly. And then he says, thirdly, as we do for you. Those three points are key to understanding what he means and what he is implying here when he talks about love and the importance of love in this whole maturation and sanctification process. First and foremost, he says, may God give an increase for your love. May you abound in love because of the work that God's doing in you for the saints. May may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another. And so here we have to understand that even when it comes to how we love one another, whether it be husband or wife or parent, child, or church member to church member, believer to a believer. All of that is generated through and increased by the power of God at work in our lives. 
It is a spiritual work that God is doing in us. And so Paul is praying that their love for one another would grow and increase and, and abound. Because in difficulties, we can become more focused on self and our own personal comforts rather than on the needs of others. And Paul is praying that God would do amazing work in their lives and growing them in love for one another. And Jesus taught about this. He, he told his disciples, they will know you are my disciples by your Love for one another. So it was a theme in Jesus' teaching. It is a prominent theme in the epistles and the rest of the New Testament because it is an important aspect of our, our ability to minister to one another. It's a part of lining ourselves with God. God loves us, therefore we're able to love one another. And so as we operate in the love of God, we're able to love one another as God would have us. And, and it takes work and it is supernatural. It's a spiritual work that God does in us. And so it's a major focus in the epistles. And constantly they are warned and, and that if there's someone that's not showing love, then they need to deal with that. And, and, and there's a constant admonitions to love one another and to make sure that we are caring for one another. Because it's an important part of our process of maturation and sanctification. So first of all, Paul says, may God increase and abound your love for one another or for the saints, for the church. It's an important thing. But Paul doesn't stop there. He also says, I want to see your love abound and increase through the work of God in your hearts for all. And again, we can go to the scriptures and we can, we can see the example of Jesus, how he was constantly being accused of going to those that were considered to be unclean or those that were considered to be less than desirable. But Jesus' love drew himself to them. And we see that emphasis in the New Testament in, in, in other places as well, as that we are to have care for one another. Galatians talked about that we should do good unto all men, but especially to those of the household of faith. But we're to have this responsibility to do well for others. There is the, the emphasis on the Great Commission that we have as the responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we have to be driven by our love for God and for our fellow man. And so Paul here is saying something that's very significant for us to note. He's telling the Thessalonians, yes, love one another. And that's easy because if you become part of the family of God, you can love one another and it makes it easy for you to do that because you have a common God, you have a common belief, you have a common goal. There's a lot of commonalities and so it draws you together in a brotherhood, in kindredness. Now, it's not without its difficulties. It doesn't mean it's going to be always easy, but it's a lot easier to come together with people who are of like mind than those who are not of like mind. But Paul says, I want your love to increase and abound for all, which would include those who were persecuting them, those that were standing in opposition to the work that God was doing in Thessalonica. And so it's very, very pointed here for us to stop and pause and say, wait a minute. God's asking us to love those who may be opposing us. Yes, that's true. That's exactly what he's saying. And so as we recognize this responsibility, this great commission responsibility, especially in the day and age where we are right now and the difficulties we're faced, we have to remember that God has called us to love all people. And, and, and yes, we have a responsibility to love one another, but to love all people. So first of all, he says, love, all, love one another. Secondly, love all the unbelievers, everyone around you, whether they oppose you or not, love them. And then Paul makes this qualification here. He sets out himself as an example. He says, even as I do for you. Look at what he says in the latter part there. As we do for you. The last part there of verse 12. So Paul gives for example. Paul is the example, his love for them. And when we look at what Paul's talking about here, he doesn't get into a lot of detail. 
But when you study the life of Paul, you study the ministry of Paul, you hear the heart of Paul in 1 Thessalonians, and you see it in other of his letters as well. Paul had two very important components of his love for the brethren. First of all, it was sacrificial. Paul was willing to give everything. He was willing to face whatever obstacles. He's still praying, God, send me back to Thessalonica, that he had to leave because of fear of, his, of being put to death. But he still longs to go back to him. Paul wasn't afraid of these things. Paul's writing to encourage them so that they won't become discouraged and all these things. And so when you study the book of Philippians, when you study the book of Romans, and you study the books of, of his letters of his, that he wrote to the various churches, you hear Paul say this very same thing. I'm willing to give everything. Paul even says, I would, I would much rather die and allow my countrymen to understand who Jesus is than to have it all for myself. Paul was sacrificial in his love for one another. But second thing that we can see when we study the life of Paul and his ministry, not only was he sacrificial, he was willing to give of his body, his life, his soul, his energy. If he had to work for a while, he would do that. If he received money from the other churches, he would welcome that. But he was willing to do whatever it took in order to fulfill the ministry that God had given him. He was sacrificial, but he was also God-focused in his priorities. That comes up. Paul's life and priorities were about the spiritual well-being of his people. So he sacrificed much to see this happen. It was serious business to Paul. Paul was willing to take whatever risks, to do whatever was necessary, and to, to look for every opportunity that he had to make spiritual priorities count in the life of those he came in contact with. Paul's life was all about sacrifice and these God-focused priorities. It drove him. And so relationships were more than just the casual kinds that we often have or the surface level that we often have. For Paul, those relationships were an opportunity to pour out spiritual well-being and, and goodness to the individuals that he came in contact. Paul's life was about making sure others became closer to God because of their contact with Him. I think that's an important thing for us to consider in our own lives and the way that we live our lives and the way that we understand the relationships that we have with one another and with our community. When people come in contact with us, are they going to be moved to move closer to God? Are they going to be challenged about their lives and what they're doing with their lives, being challenged about the claims of Christ and the gospel on their life? Are they going to be challenged that way or are we going to just keep it surface and, and, and just keep it light and, and friendly? You see, I think what Paul's trying to say here is the goal of our love for one another should be to produce holiness and not happiness. That doesn't mean being happy or joyful is a bad thing, but Paul's focus was on the holiness or the sanctification of each and every individual, the growth and the maturity in Christ of each and every individual. Paul was driven to seek out people and to impart to them spiritual truth that would move them further down the road of spiritual maturity. It was a priority. It was a God-focused priority. You see that in the life of Jesus as well. Jesus, every time he got, he would try to, to, to work with his disciples or he would teach the crowds that would gather around him. And they, didn't always, they weren't always happy with him. They were oftentimes confused by him. But Jesus continued to move them closer to God. His goal was holiness, not happiness. And I think sometimes we get off track in our relationships. We, we want to make people happy. We want to keep everything, you know, just kind of settled. We don't want to upset the apple cart. Spiritual growth and maturation, sanctification doesn't happen very well when our goal is one another's happiness. We are not loving one another very well when our goal is happiness. 
Our goal is holiness, and holiness is the pathway for us to arrive at a place of joy and contentment that God has. See, we have to begin to understand that God's goal for our life is to become more like Him, and that is what will bring true fulfillment in our lives. And until we believe that, we're going to continue to be trapped in trying to make relationships happy and, and, and no trouble. And, and let, you know, I don't want to do anything that will upset you. No, spiritual growth and maturity come as we challenge one another, lovingly challenge one another to take the next steps in our growth and maturation and sanctification process. And that's why I think Paul prays this way. Paul prays that first and foremost, God would be at work, and he is. And then he prayed that God would produce in them a love for one another and for all, and a love that is exemplified by Paul's life, one that is sacrificial and God-focused priorities, the goal of holiness, not necessarily happiness. And it'll change the way we look at our relationships. Now, the third thing that Paul brings up in this prayer, he, he talks about the role of God, and he talks about the importance of love, but he also talks about the coming accountability. And, and really, this is where Paul wants to get to in his book. He has been told, apparently by Timothy, that there's some confusion over the return of Christ. He'll get to that in chapter 4, but he's mentioned this return of Christ already a couple of times, and now it comes up in his prayer so look at, listen as I read it again, the, 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 the prayer. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. There we have our first two points, the role of God, the importance of love. Now verse 13, and this is what he says. So that, here's the result that he's looking for. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. And again, he emphasizes the work of God here. So that he, that is God, may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. And so here Paul is looking towards that future time when we will all be before God and before Jesus and in the return that is, is coming. And so Paul is talking about accountability. He lived his life with the idea that everything that he's doing is leading up to a point when Jesus will return. And he's living his life faithfully, sacrificially for the growth and maturity of the church, the sanctification of the church and of people and individuals that were brought into his life. And he sees that it is God's work that he's involved in here. He's just a tool. He's just an instrument. And he sees the importance of loving one another enough to, to, to not be satisfied with where we're at, but to seek growth and maturity and to continually see God do a work in our lives. And so Paul recognizes that there's a coming day when we will all stand before God and give an account. Paul talks about it in various of, uh, parts of his letters where he recognizes that we're going to give an account. It's not a matter of whether we've done enough to be saved, but whether our works are worthy of reward, how we've lived our lives. Paul talks to the, the Corinthian believers and he says, you'll be saved even though it's by fire, but some men will build their homes, their structures, their lives with wood, hay, and stubble, and others with gold and uh, silver and precious stones. And all of those things will be tested by fire. There's going to come a day when we're going to give an account before God of how we've lived our life in light of the gift of the gospel that he's given to us. Have we lived our lives in obedience to him? Have we continued to grow in our knowledge of who He is and what He expects of us? Have we been involved in bringing others and loving them enough to challenge them and bring them along? That's what drove Paul. Paul knew that there was coming a day when he would stand before God. And he knew that there was coming a day when there was going to be reward. And that's when it talks about here in the latter part at the coming of our Lord Jesus and, and the culmination of everything when, when he will come with all of his saints and the reward will be brought and we will be able to spend eternity with him. Paul lived his life with the expectation that there's coming a day when we will give an account and we will receive reward. 
And then we would be able to spend eternity with him. Now, there was confusion in Thessalonica concerning this return of the Lord. But at this point, Paul is praying that they will understand the coming accountability. And they too will live their life as those who will one day stand before God and one day be there for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. It gave them hope. It gave them purpose in life. And so we have to understand the responsibility that we have to live our lives with that accountability in mind. And I think what we see here as well as in Paul's other letters, living in expectation of Christ's return has a purifying effect on our lives, leading to greater levels of maturity and sanctification. Paul looked towards that. He knew he was going to that, 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 uh, that uh, reward. Paul says, I live my life. I count all things in the past but lost, but I seek the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Paul lived his life that way. And because of that, he was always living in expectation. His whole life was changed in his direction. His focus, his priorities were all built on there's coming a day, and a day of, of accountability when I stand before God at the coming of Jesus Christ. So this living with the expectation of Christ's return has a purifying effect on our lives. And it leads to these greater levels of maturity and sanctification. And that's why I think Paul brings it up in his prayer. That's why he prays. God, do a work. And God, increase their love so that they will be established. Their hearts will be established blameless and in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all the saints. Paul was driven by that. It had a purifying, sanctifying effect in his life. And, and I think there's that, there's that need in our lives. We, we talk a lot about the expectation of the return of the Lord and it should change our days and our decisions in our, each of our days. We talk about how that if we live with the expectation that perhaps it's today. I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out how we're going to do Good Friday and how we're going to do Easter if we can't gather. We may not have to worry about it. Christ may come back. We should, we're supposed to live that way. And if it's truly the fact that Christ could come back at any moment, then we should live our lives in alignment with that. And I think that's what Paul's praying, that they would live in that way. But I think sometimes because we don't see it, we sometimes forget it and we don't live that way. It's interesting, though, if we would keep that as our focus, how much it would have an effect on our lives. For instance, if I go out here of this building and I go out to the Main Street Hampstead Road here, and if I turn left coming out of the church and head down towards the Dairy Circle, there's going to be a place where the 35 mile an hour zone turns into 30. For those who have been around Calvary for a long time, it's right before you get to the Straightens Old Home. But there's this sign in it. It flashes at you and tells you how fast you're going. It's just blinking at you. It's almost like it's yelling at you. You, you, you speeder, what do you think you're doing? It's 35, it's 35 there, but it's 30 miles an hour ahead. Slow down, slow down. It's just like this flash that's going at you. When I first saw it, I said, well, that's dumb. There's no policeman around. What are they going to do? But it's, there's something that happens every time I see it. It's almost like my foot moves off the gas, hits the, ga the, the brake, and I begin to slow down. And then I see my speed, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm 34 miles an hour, and it's only 30. It has a sanctifying effect on me. It, it, it has a purifying effect. All of a sudden, it makes me very much aware that there's been a change. There's something to anticipate. There's something different that's coming. And I think that's why Paul brings this up over and over again in his writings. I think it was constantly on Paul's mind. It was like a speed limit sign flashing out there. The return of Christ is coming, is coming, is coming. Change your behavior, change your behavior, change your behavior. Live in light of what's coming ahead. So what is your life lived on? What are you living in expectation of? You see, there's a lot going on right now that could cause us to become very distracted and to get our minds off of eternal things. But I pray that we will have this mindset 
This is why this pastoral prayer is so encouraging because it tells us that even though we may be isolated, the fact of the matter is God is at work. Even though we may be torn apart, as Paul talks about here, we can still love one another and we can live with that expectation that He's coming back. And therefore, our focus needs to be on what is eternal of value in my life? What is, what, what is my life doing to make a difference for the kingdom? How am I living? Am I living for Him or am I living for myself? Or am I worried about right now or I'm living with the confidence that God is at work in me and others and He's got a plan and He's moving us forward and I can keep my eyes focused on Him and someday, hopefully soon, He returns. But until then, we're faithful. We continue to live in light of His return. We continue to live as if He will come back at any moment. So Paul's pastorly prayer here, I think, gives us great encouragement. It matters not what happens in our world. It matters not how scattered we may become. God is at work. Our love continue can grow for one another and for all. And we wait in anticipation the coming of the Lord. And it affects the way we live our lives. May God give us His peace in these days, but also may He give us His priorities that we would live in expectation of His return and in anticipation of the work that God can do in and through us because He's alive and well and doing His work. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to look at it, even though we're scattered abroad and all over and we're not even able to get together as we would like. But your word is timely. It's helpful. Use it to encourage us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for being here with us this morning. We pray that you were encouraged by the message that you just heard. And we're going to be a people that are going to have to wait a while. We could be uh, doing this for a little bit longer than we hoped for. But we can rest in the work and person of Jesus. We can wait upon him because we know he's going to strengthen us. We know he's going to provide for us, that he's going to continue to give us counsel. And so whatever you're going through, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're, you're processing, let's do that while we rest his promises. Let's sing this together. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy love being heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee, and thy beauty my soul, for by thy transforming power, thou hast made me whole. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding
satisfies my heart, satisfies its deepest longings, meets supplies its every need, compasseth me round with blessings, thine is love Sunshine of my Father's face Keep me ever trusting, resting Fill me with thy grace Jesus, I am resting, resting In the joy of what thou art I am finding out the greatness Of thy loving heart Jesus, I am resting joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. God bless. Be encouraged. You're not alone. Continue to connect with us. Have a great week. We look forward to connecting with you next week online.